Battle of Tsushima. Well, the fleets of the Battle of Tsushima, to be honest. And I have to admit, I'm hoping this will go up on time. Mainly because I've started a little late because of things going on. Thing, having to deal with things. Anyway, this is a topic which has interested me for a long, long time. Because the concept, and it seemed really strange to me, to someone who had been to some extent, raised on the Age of Sail and the great battles that took place in the Atlantic and North Sea and, and you know, World War II and World War I. You have this massive war, this massive battle that takes place in 1905, in a period where we are supposedly at peace. And to nine-year-old me, that was an absolutely amazing thing to learn about. It really was. And I was very lucky because when it came to my A-levels, I got to do a specific history module, which is kind of rare, but you're able to do it, where instead of doing a normal examination coursework and topic, you do an eight-hour timed essay on any topic of your choice, as long as you present the, pay the question to them and they accept the question. So basically, you have to go into under exam conditions and write from memory for eight hours to write a paper of suitable size and breadth and understanding on a topic. I chose the development of dreadnoughts. And the Battle of Tsushima and the Battle of Lisa were the key points. They were key points. One proved that they were on the right track, one showed them the track. Because the Battle of Lisa, at its beginning point, suggests that ramming is going to be there, but also just firing and salvo firing and long-range firing are all part of it. They're just small parts of it, but they're there. They're showing the route that things to be going down. And smart people watching it, and there were a lot of smart people reading and looking at the Battle of Lisa, worked that one out. The Battle of Tsushima... Well... It shows the value of those capabilities, and it shows the fact that, how do I put this politely? Just calling a ship a battleship didn't help you. Just having a larger number of battleships and big guns doesn't mean you're going to win. The lesson of the Battle of Tsushima is you need to build a balanced fleet. And the really interesting thing that comes from that is if we look at World War One, and we look at the British development for World War One, if the British had pursued a similar strand of development as the Germans in response to the German construction, and had focused just on capital ships, just on battleships and battle cruisers, and ignored cruisers like the Germans did, and to an extent ignored large destroy destroyers as well, the British would be in a far, far worse position. They'd have been just as lopsided as the German high seas fleet. Admittedly, Admiral Beatty's inability to communicate did cause fun for that one and did his level better, uh, thanks to it, was doing his level best to allow the Germans to win that one, despite the work of Jellicoe and Room 40 and various other people, but we'll leave that to one side. You can't put Chutland entirely down to him. There's also an operations officer at the Admiralty who decided to be smart about the questions he asked Room 40 rather than asking for the information. Wanted a shaft that he knew the code name and the uh, code name that, sh that Spear used. Yes, you know, I've got, I've got the code name for, that Shear uses. It's brilliant. It shows how strong I am. How brilliant I am. And that's the codename he uses when he's in harbour. So where's that? Of course it's still in harbour. That's not what he does when he goes to sea. If you'd asked where Shear was, like any sensible person would be, the whole signal that the German high seas fleet wasn't at sea would never have gone out to the Grand Fleet and things would have been very different. But luckily, Togo Hayashiro doesn't have to deal with any of that. In fact, 
Togo Hayashiro can pretty much ignore everyone the moment he's at sea. It's brilliant. Wireless technology at this point, and radio technology, is at the point at which he can get information, but not at the point anyone can really command him. <laughs> it's just, it's the perfect period in naval history. We can get, finally get the information from shore, we can tell them when we're coming in so we get some food ready for when we get there, but there's not a good enough technology so that they can actually try and give us orders. It's brilliant! <sighs> It only lasted for a few months, a, a couple of years at best, but it was it was a golden age. I'm, I'm sure the naval officers who lived through that period remembered it very fondly. Just enough radio communications you can get, do the stuff you want, not so much that anyone can do what you don't want them to do. At a point about the Battle of Tashima that really stuck out, uh, stuck, uh, sticks out to me is that the Rosensky Zinovi Rozvensky managed to pull together an absolutely atrocious fleet. An absolutely atrocious fleet, which I know a lot of people are talking about on paper. Oh, they're going to win. They're going to win. Well, we'll get into that and you'll see why they should never have been sent in the condition they're in. I'll leave that to one side. Because this is all about the ships. This video is about ships. They managed to sail 18,000 nautical miles in seven months. That's the distance to the Falkland Islands and back and then some more. They do that in 1905. And then they're going to fight a battle. And they do, they're they not like Britain. They don't have major yards and facilities everywhere in the world. That's one of the things for Britain, which is a sort of becomes a conceit, especially after World War I, and exam, that, we ha that Britain has so many bases and yards around the world. It's a legacy of the Russo-Japanese War and watching what happens to the Russians, that the British build up their infrastructure around the world as much as they do, and that means they don't really think as much of necessarily mobile infrastructure in terms of large-scale mobile infrastructure. They're thinking of it in terms of filling in the gaps between their existing infrastructure and where they want to be, not in terms of sp globe spanning or movement um, large-scale movements because they move from base to base or they supply from the bases as they move with ships coming out from the base to supply them and then going back to the bases shameless book plug or would one of my videos be about a shameless book plug um mainly it would be missing something which is a lot of fun to read i hope still I have got more books coming, as said. <laughs> currently, everything going on in my life is currently managing to conspire, I swear, to make free tasks as impossible as possible. One of them is getting the books out. Um, the other one is sorting out the final details of turning my thesis into a book. D -d 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 those two things, that, one's, uh, they've been projects now for about three years. And they've been put aside for various things, but life keeps happening. Every time I go, right then, now I'm going to concentrate on that this month, something goes hap happens. This month is moving houses, it's looking into new houses. And my poor mum having an accident on steps and all sorts of fun things. She's okay, she's fine. We're still going around the houses. It's, it's all good. And the third third issue, which keeps coming up, is getting to some of the archives in the north of England and Scotland. I will get there. I will get there. But again, kind of the whole having to spend time travelling around the country house hunting means that the money that would go on one, and the time, not just the money, the time that would go on going to those archives, has had to go on house hunting. Please note, I would. Before, this is a complete aside to this entire video, but I would like to say this. I think there should be an international moratorium on state agents and linguistics. I think there should be a defined reasoning of what exactly equates to a viable bedroom. My view is any bedroom where anyone who is, I don't know, well, I'm not the tallest, I'm pretty much bang on six foot it's maybe just thunder depends on the shoes I'm in 
honestly, but I'm pretty much bang on six foot in most in most shoes when I'm walking around. So I'm just under that and uh, without in socks. And yeah, the uh, if I'm having to physically bend down half height to get through a doorway, that room on the other side is not a bedroom. Okay, just uh, that's just 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 basic requirement. Okay, if it doesn't have a window in, and you can't fit a bed in there, it is not a bedroom. Calling it a separate bedroom does not make it a bedroom. Okay, if I would have to literally bash through the roof to give it enough space for anyone to actually rebuild the entire roof, for anyone to actually use it as a bedroom, it is not a bedroom. Okay. I'd also like to note certain other things in that there is a strange desire in the UK. I have never been realised this before the, before doing this house hunting, but I, it's coming across me recently to have steps in kitchens. The amount of kitchens which seem to be split level, and I kid you not. Literally, there is a cooker, let's say, it's a galley kitchen, a long line, but sometimes they're doing that. And they'll have the cooker at one end, and then they'll have steps in the kitchen. Sometimes, more than one, they'll have two, and then the fridge will be the other end. Why would you do that to yourself? You'll just keep going up and saying, I know we all like step exercise, but why? Sorry, aside, completely. But, you know, steps in your kitchen between your fridge and your cooker? That's just asking for trouble. That is just trying to give yourself stress. So don't understand it. Don't, sorry, sorry, completely off topic. <sighs> so, the Russo-Japanese War. It was a nightmare, okay? Despite having fought as allies in the Boxer Rebellion, the fact is the Japanese didn't like the Russians' desires for ever-increasing expansion. To be fair, they weren't the only ones. The entire reason for the Russia, uh, for the Anglo-Japanese alliance was that, frankly, the British were worried about the Russians and the Fr uh, Russians and the French, and they thought the Russians were planning on getting to India by going via Afghanistan. And if they ended up with war, then they don't with war the French, and they didn't want to face two powers at the same time while they had to secure the Far East. Well, they needed to have their major fleet in Europe and dealing with the other issues with the French fleet and the Mediterranean and the Russians in the Baltic and the North Sea and the North Atlantic and also possibly the Mediterranean coming through the Black Sea depending on how the Ottomans went. The fact is the British saw that as this is going to become a very general problem very quickly. We can't rely on the, Ger the Prussians anymore. The Germans, since they become Germans, we cannot rely on them. Okay. They're too much out for themselves. That's a problem. They used to be our traditional ally. It used to be the Anglo-German alliance, Anglo sort of Prussian Germanic, Anglo-Germanic alliance versus the Franco, the Franco-Russian alliance. Uh, it didn't really work out. It's uh, that's the scenario they're faced with. It's just not working anymore. So they go to Japan, and Japan's a fellow island nation. And who is annoying them in the most world? Oh, the Russians. That's cute. And frankly, they serve both needs. Because for the British, it means that there is a source of troops and a navy in the Far East who are very prepared and very happy to fight if they find themselves taking on the French, uh, French and Russians. So while the British are sorting themselves out and getting their resources and spooling up the army and deploying the Indian army wherever it needs to be, they can be fairly sure their Far Eastern spaces are going to be protected. The Japanese will look after them. And in return, the Japanese can guarantee that if the Russians bring in, both the, uh, bring in the French as well as them, then they will not be alone. They'll be joined by the world's largest battle fleet at the time, and, well, honestly... That battle fleet will consider whatever's coming out past it from Russia to be target practice. Because it's not much else. The problems for the Russians were that to save money, they basically focused all their spending in terms of maintenance and training 
on their Pacific Squadron. That same Pacific Squadron also had probably their best Admiral in charge of it. The first Pacific Squadron. The problems begin when they get held up in Port Arthur, and whilst they make some spirited attacks and do sometimes catch Togo, Togo Hayachiro uh, off guard by doing some surprising things, they manage to get themselves annihilated, and they lose their leadership pretty darn quickly as the war goes on. In fact... Honestly, the Japanese pretty much make a sport of wiping out Russian senior officers. The Russians also make a sport of wiping out Russian senior officers, usually using such things as alcoholism and um, interesting food. But the Japanese are using artillery and at least are perhaps give, giving the uh, giving the officers a fair chance. They're not pressuring them to be submit uh, to submit to the artillery strikes. They are just arranging them to happen. It's an option. Priority though has been the fleet blockading in Port Arthur and the ground war going on around Port Arthur. Port Arthur is a critical base for the Russians. With it, they have access to warm water. Now, let me please explain what we mean by a warm water port, okay, and why it matters. Warm water ports are ports which are open all year. They don't freeze up. This is something which the Russians have a lot of problems with. A lot of their bases like to freeze up. A lot of their shipyards like to freeze up. A lot of their ports like to freeze up, which means they cannot either get stuff in or out. So a lot of their infrastructure shuts down. I, they have seasonal infrastructure. At certain times of year, it is in a patch of ice. It's useless. At other times of year, it works. Great. But seasonal infrastructure is just not good. It's not what you need to have. You need to have something more. You need to have something viable to build an economy. And so Russia, Soviet Union, pretty much whatever it's been called at any point, has always been searching for access to these waters. And then people point to the Crimea and the Black Sea and go, well, there you go, they've got it, haven't they? The trouble is that goes out through the Strait the Dardanelles, the Straits of the Dardanelles, the Dardanelles Straits. And there are treaty limitations. And there's another power which controls it, the Ottomans. Now, and later on the Turks, that that's another reason why the Russians were always pushing on Constantinople and why even the French were keen on the Ottomans surviving. Why? Because if their ally had access to warm water, well, then they wouldn't be as dependent on the French, would they? Alliances, they're always a double-edged sword. It's always, does the cost, just, uh, are the costs justified by the benefits? You always have to decide that one and think that one through. So, let's consider our commanders for the fleet action. We have Togo Hachiro who is a consummate admiral. He really is a consummate admiral. That's not to say he's perfect. That's not to say anything like that. That's to say he is a consummate admiral. He's made mistakes and he's grown from them. And he's been able to have the opportunity to grow from them. He is an experienced commander. And that is something which cannot be forgotten. He fought in the Anglo-Satsuma War, which I've done a video about. He fought in the Boshin War, at the Battle of Awa, the Battle of Hakodoke, and the Battle of Meioka Bay. He fought, uh, fought in the First Sino-Japanese War, and, of course, the Russo-Japanese War. And he's already done the Battle of Port Arthur, the Battle of Yellow Sea. This is the Battle of Tsushima. Not only has he had an experience and a lot of time and opportunity to learn, to develop and grow his skills, 
He's also built his command structure up to such an extent that he can be sure of its temper. He can be sure of the quality of the blade he has forged. And he has forged it. This is one of the really interesting things. You're talking about a command structure where a large number of these officers have grown up together. Have come through to service together. Have been part of forging and building a new navy together. They might not like each other. They might not agree with each other. But they know each other. And they know their skills. And they know what they're there for. And they know when he gives an order, they follow it. They're not going to start questioning him. They're not going to start disobeying him. They're not going to go, well, we know better because we are a higher imperial rank. They don't care about that. Because they know that the only thing, the only thing that matters is winning the war. That's what they've been taught. That's what they've been trained. Then we have Paul Zinovi Rozelensky. <sighs> Look. Southern Admirals, they are a command fighting personality. And you need those. You need those to lead your, say, uh, lead your sailors in wartime. Some Admirals, they are a cross between a dreamer and an engineer. They're the ones who come up with the Navy that's going to fight your future wars. They're the ones who listen to the reports and turn your navy into an effective machine by designing and building those machines. Rosansky is not inexperienced. He'd fought in the Russo-Turkish War. He had been awarded the Order of St. George and the Order of St. Vladimir. He had while being a you know a gunboat serving on the Vesta, he'd actually been in a torpedo boat that had attacked an Ottoman battleship. He's got some credentials then behind him, but he knows he's not the command admiral. He's the admiral chosen because no one else is left. Look, there are a few admirals in history who go down as being both able of being able to be the Grand Command Admiral, the one who leads the fleets in the war, and the ones who conceive of the fleets. But they are incredibly rare. I'm currently thinking through the Royal Navy, and I can name three in their entirety of history who have been that. And all three of those have were rather late on. We're talking 20th century. When there was a lot more naval in, and a lot more naval education, a lot more preparation, a lot more s uh, development of skills cro across things to enable them to have the vocabulary to be able to dream and design ships and develop them. But those personalities are rare, and you need them. You need that dreamer slash engineer, the one who's going to dream up. The cons when hearing the, what the requirements are for the future of war is going to dream up the system that can do uh, that can carry those out and then has the engineering skills to create that. But there is also a problem with that. It means as an officer, I'm just checking on a certain senior research assistant. As an officer. He knows in his head how ships should be used, how the ships should be being used, how people should be performing. This is one of the reasons why I can see him getting so mad and doing so many things to binoculars during his uh, trip that he keeps throwing them away and breaking them. Because he is seeing his fleet not performing as it should do. Not only is he not given time to work up, a, work up his fleet or forge his command chain and his, his officers into, an, into a weapon, into something he can use, he has to deploy them around the world. So instead of time which he would prefer to be spending, honestly, training them up, he's moving. And there is very little you can do. There is a limitation to what you can do. Furthermore, that senior officers who he has faith in die. And he's left with... Well, honestly, he's left with a mixed bag. He's left with officers 
who possibly should never have been sent anywhere near a war zone, officers who should never have achieved command, and officers who are only there because they have the status to demand they're there. You couldn't have two more different instruments and two more different, in a way, leaders. Both are thoroughly professional, both are thoroughly well-versed in their fields. But one is most definitely a fighting, a fighting admiral. An admiral who has gone up that path and who would probably not, if you asked him, try to design a future ship or a future fleet. He might go, this is what we need to be able to do. And that's probably what he'll do. But he'd expect to have admirals around who are like Rosansky to turn that vision into reality. To take his requirements, turn it into a vision, and then turn that vision into something that can be built. That's, again, nothing bad to say about Hayachiro. It's very capable there. You are talking about a personality which, as said, in I, the Royal Navy's history, I can think of three who've had that skill. Admiral Cunningham is not one of them. Let's be honest, the biggest problems that come from Admiral Cunningham was when he was first Sea Lord, and he tries mucking around in third Sea Lord in, in designing, developing, building ships and mucking around with that. That's when big problems arise for him. We will never know with Admiral Henderson whether he would have been good at command. He was the first Sea Lord who developed the Royal Navy running up to World War II because he died before he could be sent out to command anything in terms of a fleet, uh, naval force. We know when he was an, uh, an officer below the rank of Admiral, he was very, very good. We know as Rear Admiral and Aircraft Carriers he was good, but we don't know so how he would have actually turned out. Admiral Jellicoe is pretty much one of the few officers who you can point to who was capable of doing both sides. And we all know how rare Admiral Jellicoe was. You can... Fisher, again, doesn't have actually much fleet command in terms of a war experience. He doesn't really have any. He's very good at the deterrence game. And he's good at turning visions into reality and playing the political games as necessary for that. But yeah, that, it's a rare personality to do both. So when I say someone can't do both, I'm not critiquing them. I'm just saying this is how it is. And the same with Zolensky. He was an able small boat, uh, small ship commander. He is an able engineer and an able visionary. But he's the founder of the Technology Association of Bulgaria. One of them, anyway. He, he, he's, he is an air gunnery officer, an engineering officer. He is, he is not the person who you would automatically pick to command a fleet for the Far East. He's pretty much the only one, though, available. He's the only one of the officers who are left at the Tsar and the court's disposal who is remotely professional enough to actually be able to even get the fleet out there. And that's the, that's the thing. There are officers they have who are dashing, who would probably do the leadership role maybe better, but their ability to organise... Well, how do I put this right? Well, their ability to organise a caffeine high in a coffee shop would be questionable. There you go. That's a nice safe YouTube safe way of saying that. They just weren't able to do the organisation. And if you're going to get the, the forces out to the Far East, that's the criteria. They need to be able to get them the 8, 18,000 nautical miles first. So... We have an officer who's, well, been doing staff and, well, more sort of academic works. He, he commanded the salvage operation for the, uh, the General Admiral Graf Arpaskin, which was, of course, an Admiral Ushkov-class uh, coastal defense ship. 
in 1900. And of course, that's one of the ships which is actually sent with him. Lucky him. He must be thinking, lucky me. I salvaged this ship and now I've got it with me. So, here is the stats which people looked at. When they're talking about the war between Japan and Russia, and they're looking and going, Russia's going to stop this. So where do we hear this, this phraseology so often these days? Oh yeah, pretty much every time there's a war, people just look at the stats and go, the, the, the power of the most systems is going to stop this. Because look at Russia here. Their cumulative power is 21 battleships with five in reserve. Three coastal defense ships, or, you know, uh, eight armored cruisers, 13 other cruisers probably protected with five others doing... I'm not quite sure what the brackets is from this one. Literally, I have copied this out of Wikipedia because when I saw this put in, up in Wikipedia, it just went, that demonstrates everything. Because I was doing my usual where I mine Wikipedia shamelessly for pictures. Look, uh, and the criteria, as I've always said, is I want to check that the pictures are open source before I use them because I don't want to get into any copyright issues. I always teach my students the same thing. If it's on Wikipedia and it's available on Wikipedia, you've got good precedence that it's open source and open copy. Doesn't always work out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a good starting spot. So while I was mining at shamelessly for pictures, I found this, uh, this table and went, Ah, uh, yeah, that demonstrates so precisely exactly what everyone's talking about. Oh, you've got all these battleships, you've got all these destroyers, you've got all these torpedo boats. Russia will stomp Japan. The problem is, it doesn't matter how many cumulatively you have of anything. What matters is how much you can actually get to where you need it to be. When you need it to be, and in what order. You see, having all those torpedo boats, all those destroyers, is great if they are available to escort your fleet. If they're not, if they're all at home, uh, you're in trouble. Or even worse, if the ones you're relying on being there, because they're in the Pacific, are lost and you can't get to them, then you're in major trouble. Because that's really what happens. Look at the Pacific Fleet in terms of its destroyers, torpedo boats. That is a major concentration of Russian power. Yes, there's a load of torpedo boats in the Baltic, but those aren't really going to get much get anywhere, are they? Especially not the ones which are below 40 tons. They're not getting anywhere. And if we look at the concentration of Russian ships, they have put... Some in the Pacific, probably their better ships. As let's be honest, the Pacific was a primary air expansion, plus it was also an area where they couldn't support that many ships. So the ships they had to put out there had to be able to punch above their weight in terms of numbers. So they put their best ships, they put some of their best commanders, they put them out there, and they run into the numbers of the Japan Japanese. Because again, when you start looking through the thing, uh, through the list, you're sitting there going, well. Japan was planning a 6-6 fleet. That's really what they were planning post the uh, Sino-Japanese War. And that was an important one. The first Sino-Japanese War is a great thing for the Japanese as it, not only did they win it, does it show the Juno Cold strategy doesn't work, it also gives them the money to invest in their 6-6 plan of six battleships and six armoured cruisers, which are large enough to support their battleships and require that any enemy sending a fleet out to fight them sends at least 12 battleships. And there's your Russian problem. They've got seven out there. They have four armoured cruisers. They have seven cruisers to Japan's 16. Cruisers under 2,000 tonnes. Another 10. To Russia's free. Gunboats. Torpedo gunboats. The Pacific, the Pacific Fleet outnumbers the Japanese. 2 to 1. But in regular gunboats, it's 7 to 7. And once you start going down numbers again, well, the Japanese have a lot more torpedo boats. A lot more torpedo boats. They have less destroyers, but a lot more torpedo boats. 
And the other advantage of the Japanese is they have major infrastructure, they have major yards. Where do the Russians have to look to for their reinforcements for the Pacific? Well, they have to come from the Baltic and the Black Sea. They don't have a northern fleet really at this point. There's nothing there worthy of a name. So it's the Baltic and the Black Sea. And that's a problem. That is a problem because those are quite literally the other side of the world and a long way away. So, let's start doing this the way we always do, which is we work through by years of construction and years of launching. And the first thing you start to realize is that Japan is ships involved in the Battle of Toshima, which are actually launched in 1905. Admittedly, they're two torpedo boat destroyers, uh, the Harasome class Arare and Fubuki. But they're there, and they're part of the first destroyer division, which, as you can tell from the color coding, is part of first squadron. Please note, I'm going to read out the notes for both fleets so you can remember them when we're going through. In command structure: first squadron of fleet commander Admiral Togo Hayajiro, blue with white lettering. Second squadron commander Vice Admiral Kaminora Hikodrino Hikonojo, uh, black with white lettering. Third squadron commander Vice Admiral Kataka uh, Kataya Shishiro, orange with white lettering. Special duty squadron Rear Admiral Ogura Bishiro. Green with white lettering. Gold lettering equals battleships. Okay, so you know where the Brit uh, where the Japanese battleships are. You know, look at all those ships, those newer ships that come out. They're all torpedo boats and torpedo boat destroyers. Hayabusa class torpedo boats and torpedo boat destroyers, mainly Harasame class from 1904 and 1905. That's what's there. So it's light ships which the Japanese are able to put into this battle. And they're going to help them shape it. The Japanese will bring to this battle four modern battleships, one ironclad battleship, eight armor cruisers, 13 protected cruisers, two second class protected cruisers, one ironclad cruiser, five unprotected cruisers, 21 torpedo boat destroyers, 45 torpedo boats, 21 armed merchant vessels, two hospital ships, and a dispatch vessel. Which also could be classified as an armed merchant vessel. The Imperial Russian Navy, which has no vessels available in this time period, none at all, well, it's a nightmare. Despite his tendency to destroy binoculars by many different means, Vice Admiral Zinovy Rozetsky, who commanded the force, had to be a combination of the patience of a saint and logistic skill of a savant. I put that in to specifically remind me to say that because honestly, it's true. To get that fleet out there, I think I would have personally executed, let alone ordering the execution, of a lot of senior officers. I have a feeling I'd have been just walking around with an axe at certain points. How he did not give in to a base desire to start executing officers for incompetence, let alone outright stupidity, is a true lesson in leadership. It's also a true lesson in self-control. He might be busting binoculars, but he's not killing people just for being an idiot, even though he deserved it. As such, it will be in the Russian sailors' blue and white stripes. And that should tell you a small problem going here. There is a small enough force in terms of numbers, and it's a confused enough command structure that I am not bothering to divide it up into different groups' colors. So whereas you have blue, or uh, you have blue, black, orange, and green coloring for the four different sections of the Japanese navy that are employed in the battle, you only have one coloring for the uh, Russians. He has four battleships. One second class battleship, one yard queen battleship, one low freeboard battleship, one fought the Victorian Sans Perel were a good idea battleship, three coastal battleships, three armor cruisers, three pro uh, five protected cruisers, two armor merchantmen, rated as cruisers, nine destroyers, two transport ships, two fleet tugs, two hospital ships, one ammunition ship, and one repair ship. And he wants some real fun. Some real, real fun. Please note that people regularly include one of the merchant ship, uh, one of the armed merchant ships as a cruiser in the numbers of overall cruisers, the, this is the overall, and the others, the other one, uh, they put in the other ships, basically. A merchant cruiser is not a cruiser. Not, no matter what the uh, Spanish-American War shows you, no matter what else happens, they're not cruisers. They're really not. 
And this is the point. This is the nightmare for the the Russians. This is what they've been scared of the entire time. Japanese torpedo boats. Now their fear of them is honestly learned, is well learned, because they've lost ships already in this war to Japanese torpedo boats. And you can see why when you look at the numbers, because Japan has a huge amount of torpedo boats to chuck away. Russia has 80, but of those, only 25 were in the Pacific and only 25 destroyers were out there. Whereas Japan can pretty much call on 85 and 22 destroyers, or as they would call the time, torpedo boat destroyers. Japan has all this force they can deploy in overwhelming numbers. They can afford to lose torpedo boats. They do. They're building them. They can afford to lose them. The Russians can't. The Russians are having to take everything with them. This is why when we're looking at this fleet and we're looking at these overall numbers at the top, looking at those numbers, and it's very, very small writing. I do apologize, so it's probably difficult to read. But they have nine destroyers with them. The Japanese have 21 torpedo boat destroyers and 45 torpedo boats with them. The Japanese are sending a balanced, rounded fleet to battle. The Russians are sending a load of capital ships without any of the escorts and without any of the wing protection. And they're sending them into these. And this is a problem because if you're going to be doing long-range fires and engaging in long-range fire with your opponent, what you want to do is two things. You want to try and fix their position so that it's easier for you to engage. And you want to disrupt their ability to return fire by making them make course changes. Small fry like this allow you to do that. It allows you to manipulate and shape your enemy fleet to suit you. And that's what the Russians do. Uh, what Russians have done to them. So, what do we have from 1903? We have a lot of ships coming through in 1903. We have the newest of the Russian ships, including the yacht slash second class cruiser, the Almaz. Do not get me started on the transport squadron. They don't have an admiral. They never had one appointed. They needed an admiral. The fact that 2nd Division started out with a rear admiral, Baron Dmitry von Volkelsam, in charge, but he died en route, and so is replaced by Captain 1st Rank Vladimir Beer, in charge of 2nd Division, worries me enough. The fact that they didn't have enough senior officers with them, and the fact that their officers died en route, okay, you expect officers to die en route, so you have a bit of a reserve with you of senior officers. Especially if you're doing all the effort you're going to do. Because you need that experience. <sighs> How do I put this politely? Senior officers are not just random people. They're people you spent tw 20, 30, 40 years training, hopefully. Gaining experience, that means you put them in leadership positions to make decisions and lead and guide others. A captain who is having to shape his complicated weapon system, i.e. his warship under his command, into a fighting platform as it trans uh, goes 18,000 nautical miles is also supposed to be responsible for the instruction, training, and coordination of other ships? That's not a good use of skill. But that's your only option because you don't have enough officers available. And you also have probably the strangest named vessel. Well, well it's, it, it's not strange, but I, there is something I find wrong, deeply wrong, about any ship which is called Oleg. It just seems wrong to me for some reason. I never know why. And that's the flagship of the 1st Cruiser Squadron Division. We have the 1st Division, 2nd Division, 1st Cruiser Division, and Transport Squadron, all in this group. First Division is directly run by Zinov Rozansky. 
And there's another little problem, because... If you look down, you'll notice that the units the ships are in, you'll notice the 1st Division, which is part of 1st Squadron, surprisingly enough, are sitting in an armoured cruiser, the Nishin, a Kasuga-class armoured cruiser, captained by Hayatero Ten uh, Takenushi, is Vice Admiral Mitsu Sotaro, who is the commander of 1st Division. So, instead of Togo Hayachiro having to command a division as well as a squadron and a fleet, he only has to concentrate on a squadron and a fleet. And let's be honest, commanding those two together is not much of an effort. Because his squadron, uh, first squadron is his primary striking tool. So he's command directly doing that and then he's coordinating others with him. So it makes sense from a leadership, from a star perspective, from a stress on personnel perspective. Rosensky is everything. Rosensky is his own division commander, his own squadron commander, his own fleet commander. The man's overworked. I also see that one of the first vessels from the uh, special duty division. Um, under Rear Admiral Ogayo Bushiro, this is of course one of the armed merchantmen, the Koyara Maru. Now, again, they have a Rear Admiral in charge of them. They are not transiting 18,000 nautical miles. They are just operating just uh, just south of Japan, well, Japan in sort of relative terms. Yet they have a rear admiral in charge of their special duty squadron, which is some of their supply ships, some of their scout ships and picket ships. But they have a rear admiral in charge of it. That's sensible! That's how you command and coordinate your ships. In reality, again, if we go back to the Russians, who is de facto in charge of the transport squadron? Rosalensky. Because he's the admiral they report to. So he's got even more. So instead of being able to detail off to an admiral who is in charge of coordinating his logistic ships, get them there. Please make sure the supplies go here. You and your staff coordinate that so I can concentrate on this. He's got to go work through that with his own staff. And yes, you can go, well, he has a staff aboard, the staff officers will do it. The trouble is that it's described as the Admiral's staff for a reason. Yes, you staff out your work. Yes, you staff, but you let others do it. But you direct it. You coordinate it. Everything is being put on this man. The fact he doesn't have... An actual metaphysical collapse, not just a mental collapse or a physical collapse, a metaphysical collapse. I'm going to go for that level, extra level of collapse. Doing all this is beyond belief and is testimony to how good of a commander he actually was. Yes, it was not really his ballywhack. He is really the engineer dreamer coming up with the next generation of warships. But he certainly works harder and does his best to deliver it all. This is the Oleg. The flagship of 1st Cruiser Division. Carrying Rear Admiral Oscar Enquist. The Oleg is launch, was launched in 1903, commissioned in 1904. It will actually be torpedoed and sunk in June 1919. It's a Bogatia class protected cruiser. What does that mean? That means it has a top speed of 23 knots. That means it has two vertical triple expansion steam engines and 16 Normand type boilers to supply them with steam. It's carrying roughly 600 officers and crew. It has a range of 2,100 nautical miles at 12 knots and it has 12 6 inch guns in two twin turrets which you can see fore, aft, 
and 18 single casemates. Again, you can see them. Quick firing six, quick firing six, six. Those would later on be replaced by 5 inch guns, but they weren't at this point. 12 11 pounder guns, 8 47 millimeter guns, 2 37 millimeter guns, 2 15 inch torpedo tubes, and it has half the armored deck. So it doesn't have really a belt, it has an armored deck. When I say that Oleg here, despite having a what I would consider an incredibly uninspiring name, is possibly the best cruiser pound for pound in the Russian fleet. Do not doubt me. It's also potentially, and I'm going to list this in carefully, it's also potentially one of the more interesting problems in the fleet. Why am I calling it a problem? Because it seems to have endless issues. And, and when I say endless issues, I mean endless issues. She has non-stop problems with spare parts for most of the trip out. And while she was part of the force that sailed from the Baltic Sea, mm, during the battle, she's damaged and managed to escape, taking the Aurora and the Zemchug, two other cruisers, with her, reaching Manila. And that's where she's interned for the rest of the, of the Russo-Japanese War. She is a ship which has a constant period of problems. Uh, she runs aground off Kronstadt in 1908. In World War One. well, she took part in mine-laying operations in the Baltic. And she's assisted in attacking the SMS Albatross. But she gets caught in lots of troubles as well. And when it comes to the Russian Revolution, she actually ends up being sunk by Captain Augustus Agar in a coastal motorboat in June 1919. Not a lucky ship. As you can see, as we go further away from the battle, more and more ships start to become present on both sides. We've got more and more torpedo boat destroyers from the Japanese. The Shirakano Kumo class, Akatsuki class, joining the Harasames now. And we also have some protected cruisers, um, including Toshima herself, which is a, Nitika, a, Niti, a Nitaka class cruiser. Pretty interesting one. Uh, in, it's in the 4th Division under Vice Admiral Urio Soto Kishi, uh, Soto Kishi. And they had a interesting, interesting battle. You also have the Manchu Maro, another of Rear Admiral Ogura Bayashero's vessels. And you have the Kasuga Armored Cruiser, which is a Giuseppe Garibaldi class, really. Under Vice Admiral Mitsu, uh, Misu Sotaro in 1st Division. So, they have an armor cruiser sitting in 1st Division. Well, that makes sense. We've also started to have battleships come in on the Russian side. We've got the Kinaz Surov, a Borodino class, basically the best ships they have available. Interesting note, the fifth Borodino, the Slava, is what causes the Germans so much fun in World War I, uh, trying to fight her. But Kinaz Surov is Rosensky's flagship. It's his ship. It's the flagship for First Division. It's the flagship for the fleet. It's everything in his force. And you also have the battleship the Oral, another Borodino class, which is also part of First Division. And we have the very interesting vessel, the uh, Kamchatka, which is the vessel which constantly seems to see Japanese torpedo boats wherever it goes. It's a repair ship. Can, doesn't have quite as interesting experience, though, in terms of history prior to the operations as the ship below, because the Andia. 
originally the the brush like a breast was ordered from a British yard honestly British uh, uh, British yard as honestly not for the Russian Navy not for the Russian Navy and ended up in the Russian Navy the Borodinos again if we go through the sort of the fleet of scenarios I'm not sure why it skipped that particular side you start to realize are some of the newest ships available to the uh, to the Russians they have no ships from 1905, no ships from 1904. They have some protected cruisers from 1903. And a yacht. A yacht which, frankly, its inclusion is absurd because it's not a warship in any way, shape or form. And then they have these in 1902 and 1901. What you should be noticing at this point is the real problem for the Russians in terms of their deployment. Russia has a grand strategic problem. They basically need four separate fleets these days. And in this time, they need three separate fleets. They need all they need their pool of infrastructure, and they need all of them to be balanced fleets. The Pacific Fleet had not been a balanced formation. This uh, first squadron, the Pacific Squadron, had not been a balanced formation. The second and third squadrons being sent out were not balanced formations in any stretch of imagination. So the entire thing is quite disturbing but again people keep going back to numbers of guns and going well they have more guns I have more guns but does it really matter the thing is the strength of the Russian fleet is the four Borodino class battleships they are the only modern, vaguely worked up, vaguely trained, vaguely well-led core of his fleet. Of Zorensky's fleet. Of Zorensky's fleet. I keep calling him Zorensky for some reason. Rozensky's fleet. And yet, for the Japanese, they have... A huge number of vessels like the Kasuga at this battle. They have other things other than battleships. They are outnumbered in battleships. Let's be honest. The If you put the battleships against battleships in a pure battleship fight, under the metrics of the times, those battleships should win. Of the, Rus the Russian battleships should win. 4v4. They are... Same design, so they're homogenous, they should work together better, they should be everything else being equal, they should be able to outfight the other four. The Japanese four, because they're not the same. But the thing is, they can't. Because Admiral Hirajiro has no intentions of playing it fair and going 4v4 fight, and yes, I'm going to lobotomize half my captain so that it's a fair fight from that perspective as well just not and then we have well the Manchu Maru versus the Kamchatka uh, both sides have merchant ships included the Japanese have more again Again, the one thing the Russians really needed was merchant ships to make to get their fleet out there, to supply their fleet. Really, and to an extent, Rosansky actually said this at the time, so I know Qualm's critiquing this because he was making his critique of the plan he was being given anyway. He needed enough merchant ships and repair ships that what he could do is get to a near port fairly nearby, neutral waters fairly nearby and docked down for about a month after he's got into the area and basically repair, restock his ships train his ships up, make sure they've all got enough food on them, make sure they've got everything they need and he ideally needs to do this within two to three days steaming of Japan not that far away. He wants to get his ships into a tip-top condition and then take them into the battle. He doesn't get that chance. He doesn't have the merchant ships to support that. Strange enough, the Japanese probably do. Oh, goody. Even more ships for the Japanese. 
So let me see what a balanced fleet looks like. The Borodino herself. And the Aurora. A Paladana class. A protected cruiser. On the Japanese side, we have the Mikasa. The squadron, fleet, squadron, fleet, fleet squadron and fleet flagship. A good ship. A very capable vessel. We also have the second division flagship, or an armored cruiser, the Iwate and Izumo class. And we have the second squadron flagship, the Izumo, another Izumo class. If you're noticing that armored cruisers and cruisers are playing a very big part of the Japanese force here, you would be right. The Japanese force is heavily cruiser orientated. They have a lot more cruisers. They have a lot more of those there. If we go back again to the, sort of the numbers at the beginning, and I'm not sure why that slide has decided to disappear. The Japanese Navy has four modern battleships, an ironclad battleship, and eight armored cruisers there, and 13 protected cruisers. The Russians, they're battleship heavy, but they have some very interesting battleships, including their numbers. But they are cruiser light. With the Japanese having more protected cruisers alone than they did than actual cumulative cruisers to their numbers. In fact, the Japanese are bringing. Mm, in terms of things called a cruiser, 24 to, the, uh, to, 24 to the battle to face off against the Russian 10. There are advantages to that. And that's a big difference in this scenario. Again, though, the vast majority of the vessels we're seeing are torpedo boat destroyers and torpedo boats. There are many armored cruisers on that, uh, that page, but again, the Japanese fleet, not that old. 1900, 1899, these are young ships. These are capable ships, but these are young ships, which is good. It means they are less likely to have problems. Then we have the Mikasa. Mikasa is your fleet flagship, and really she was built as such. She's been commissioned as such. She is the, I would say, the crowning glory of the 6-6 plan. She's preserved to this day as a memorial ship, and if ship shape, the crew I'm in with, Drakenafel, Garrus the Brit, and Dr. Dan, aka T-Driven Doc on Twitter, etc. Well, if ever we go to visit Japan, I fully expect us to spend probably about five or six days on her. Honestly, I, I, I doubt I get Drakenafel away from her for at least four days. Uh, he might talk about filming her, while, uh, you know, just spending a day filming her, but compared, con considering she's the center of a naval museum and all that she has in her and that she's the last surviving British built pre dreadnought in fact the last surviving British built battleship from the pre dreadnought and the dreadnought era yeah that's just not going to happen he's not going to go he's not going to leave her He's going to want to go around her a lot. And I want to as well. 15,380 tons displaced in normal. 25 Belleville boilers. Supplied two vertical triple expansion engines for a top speed of 18 knots. Or a range of 9,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. One of the things you learn very quickly is when you're looking at ships which are designed by Pacific powers to operate in the Pacific, they are very long ranged. Whereas the Russian ships are very European. Has Krupp cemented armor. Not Harvey armor. Remember Oleg. The lovely Oleg. Which 
is launched in 1903, three years after Mikasa. And yet Mikasa has crop cemented armour and the Oleg has Harvey armour. These are just some of the problems in the Russian ships. It's not just they're not necessarily as new or as well uh, as built, it's that the materials put in them are not necessarily up to the same standards of the Japanese materials being used. She is armed with four 12 inch guns. Four 12 inch guns. If we consider again the Borodino class, they're also armed with four 12 inch guns. She has about 14 6 inch guns. The Borodino class has 12. The Mikasa has 20 12 pounders. Which are, let's be honest, roughly 76 millimeters. The Russians have 20 75 millimeter guns. They are therefore not that dissimilar in terms of major firepower. But the reality is, the Mikasa has a massive advantage over the Borodinos. She's in the hands of the IGM, who are a very, very different navy from the one they're facing. They are a navy which has been forged in tumult of civil war. A navy which has been forged out of the ashes of Commodore Perry and his his squadron and what they did to Japan. Which, please note, before anyone starts to think I'm talking about the, the physical things, they don't know. It's the psychological damage they do to Japan, breaking into Japan the way they do. And it's, it's a national psychological trauma. It's, it, you can literally trace from that to the constant issues America and Japan have at communication which leads to several of the understandings which develop into the problems they have in the 1920s and 30s and World War II. And you can go back as far. And the Americans can never understand why, why Japan views them as such an aggressive and threatening nation. It's like the American high, uh, high Command has a complete blank memory space on the whole sort of, we sent a squadron to open up Japan. Yes! The British were also sending one, but the British arrived after us, and so they got greeted as heroes for making us behave when we were behaving already, but it just was associated with, what, with them showing up, and we get portrayed as villains. That's not fair. That's history. That's what happens. Sometimes being first is not best. Sometimes being first gets you into trouble. And leaves people with a nasty memory of you. The whole policy of the Japanese with the 6 6 strategy, which is kind of famous policy, was that if they had six battleships and six strong armored cruisers, then no one could afford to send six battleships to fight them because the armored cruisers would match up in with them, tag in with a battleship, and assist with the engagement. So you'd have each of your battleships trying to engage an armor cruiser and a battleship. In which case it either engages the armor cruiser and probably sinks it, but while it's doing that the battleship is not engaged, or it engages the battleship and doesn't engage the armor cruiser, or it divides its fire, in which case it's in even more trouble. It's a constant dilemma. So what's your scenario? Well, you have to send enough battleships to be able to match in with their armor cruisers. That's the requirement. Well, this is why the Russians are turning up with eight battleships and three coastal battleships. Because they figure those 11 ships can match in against the six and six. That's entirely the reasoning for the Russians have for draining every semi-viable, let alone viable ship from the, uh, from the Baltic and the Black Sea fleets. 
because they need enough to rank in against that force. Especially now they've lost the Pacific Squadron. <sighs> now we're getting into the even older ships. Even older ships. 1898 and 1897. And again, what we're looking at is a whole load of torpedo boats, protect, some protected cruisers, uh, some Kasagi protected cruisers, which are both in 3rd Division under Vice Admiral Doa Shigeto as part of 1st Squadron. Then we have the armored cruisers the Asma and the Tokwa, or both Asma class of 2nd Division, and the Rear Admiral Shinamaru Hayo, who's part of 2nd Squadron. Then we have Shikashima, which I did a video about recently, and she's in 1st Division with Vice Admiral Mizu Sotaro, under the, in fir, part of 1st Squadron, with, of course, Toko Hayachiro in charge. And, you know, when we start considering the flagship for the Special Duty Squadron, which is mentioned here, the Taichu Maru, a force of 21 armed merchant vessels, two hospital ships, and a smash vessel to support ships which are that close to your home. And that's not the only dispatch vessel, because if you notice, there's been a lot of cruisers slash, um, uh, you know, um, unprotected cruisers slash dispatch vessels in this chat, in this sort of discussion, in the slides. Why? Because the Japanese know they need to have a lot of communications going back as well. They need to have a lot of food, etc. So they're going to hold them in station. But don't worry. Russia's bought a second class battleship. They have bought the earlier Sabo. And frankly, that isn't much. That isn't much help bringing that. All this does to me, apart from this slide, show me again, and emphasize again, the nature of the Japanese force as a very balanced, coordinated force, a well spread out force. One of the things that I find really interesting is when you see this intermix of colors. They have not simply gone for old ships go in this squadron, new ships go in this squadron. They've got, between both the 1st and 2nd squadrons, they've got a very good balance going on. And they've even got some in the Special Duty Division. Special Duty Squadron. The 2nd Class Battleship, though. Oh, well, she is part of Vladimir Bear's second division. In fact, she's his flagship. The Asilaba is the flagship for him. I'm not sure why it's not showing up in the notes there, but I did write it in. And there's a reason I wrote it in. was because I was going to talk about her. This is a battle where you've got most of the big battleships wandering around with 12-inch guns. Certainly, the Japanese are here very happy with theirs. And yet, this battle, this ship, is the second class battleship. It's armed with four twin 10-inch guns. Pretty much most of the weight of a 12-inch gun, but none of the power or fruitiness. 11 single 6-inch guns. It always worries me when someone has an odd number of guns on a ship. There are reasons to have an odd number of guns, but 11, it feels like a very weird one. And you'd be right. Have a look at there, the six fire, quick firing six inch guns and work out where number 11 is and what the issue might be with that, uh, that particular gun. Then you have 20 single, uh, single uh, 75 millimeter guns, 20 single 47 millimeter guns, eight single 37 millimeter guns and five Again, five 15-inch torpedo tubes. And the ability to carry 45 mines. She has Harvey armor on her armor, uh, waterline armor belt. But just so you know, she has Krupp cemented armor on her gun turrets. So, 
when someone was designing this ship, they went, obviously we were thinking, well, she's a second class battleship. Okay. We have this amount of money to spend. Yes. We can afford some crop cemented armor. Oh, good. She's being laid down in 1895. She'll be launched in 1898. That's great. Where are we going to put that armor? All on the turrets. We're not going to put it on the belt. It's a battleship. The turrets have to be strong. Yes, you want the turrets to be strong. But in the nicest way, you're going to put nine inches of crop cemented armor on your gun turrets. Up to nine inches. And you're going to put a roughly two to three inch belt on your ship of crop cemented armor. But it's a battleship. It's going to be in line slogging it out with the enemy. And you've gone, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put between four and nine inches of armor of Harvey armor on the waterline. Because no one's going to be trying to sink uh, to hold me in the waterline, are they? You know, I'm only a battleship. What I think it's really interesting is when we look, consider this particular class, the Perisavert class. They build free ships. Uh, they build the Fopida, uh, the Perisave, and the Olisava. Olisava, she is sunk at the Battle of Tashima. The Perisave uh, is sunk during the Siege of Port Arthur in January. 1905. Hmm, you can. She was sort of scuttled in 19, December 1904, but it's captured in January 95, and pretty much in the middle of that time, does sink a fair bit. She's brought back in March 1916 by the Russian Empire after the Japanese have classified her as a coastal defense ship. And she ends up being sunk by a mine off Port Said in Egypt in January 1917. Useful purchase. And the other member of the class? The feeder? Well, she's sunk on the 7th of December 1904 and is again refloated by the Japanese and used by the Japanese. So, she's sunk by gunfire. Pretty much what we're going to say here is all three of these ships have something in common. All three of them are sunk by the Japanese. Two in shallow enough water, they actually refloat them and use them. One of which they eventually resell to the Russians. It's just... Russia has limited infrastructure. True. And therefore, they need, they cannot combine fleets. So, unlike Britain, who can sail their fleet around their coast and all the, visit all harbours in a sort of one continuous circle picking up ships, and the Americans post-construction of the Panama Canal, they can't combine forces. So there is a desire, in order to maximise numbers, to occasionally go down some interesting avenues of development and if you're comparing it to an age of sale period when you had first rate second rates third rates the third rate second rates were good ships you definitely didn't have all ships being first rate however saying that at no point did any bright spark go you know what we're building a second rate battleship okay second rate ship of the line we're going to use lighter weaker timber to save money because that's really sensible that's gonna that's gonna make this ship far more effective you can justify lighter timber if it's going to give you get a better speed but then at a certain point you have to remember that again you're built to fight in the line of battle you're built to fight going to battle at a certain point, you're not going to be able to use speed to get away. You're going to have to take a hit and keep on fighting. And at that point, armor is really attractive. At a certain point, you know you're going to have to take a hit. Armor becomes overwhelmingly attractive. I mean, 
how do I put this? So, there is a lady called Jill, I think her name is, on YouTube, who has various ratings of armor, which includes Just Stab Me Now for the... This is certainly not armor. Well, on her rating system... Now, her rating goes from I'd wear it, to pretty good, to not actually armor, which I can understand, just... She gets asked to review all sorts of things, and my little cousins are massively obsessed. I find her funny as well and enjoy enjoy watching it. But I was pointed out to, uh, to uh, about her by my little cousins, and then I wouldn't wear it and just stab me now. So in ship terms, ship terms, armor you probably go will would be excellent to yeah pretty good. He'll do most of the job to, well, I'd say to Miller Rose, you got something. You certainly got something to, what were you thinking? And the bottom line is, should I just go out there flying the white flag? So here is my problem with a second class battleship, especially one as designed like this. It's got 10 inch guns, so it can't hit as hard as uh, the 12 inch gunships is going to be facing by most of them at this point and they are going to be hitting it and they will have the same rate of fire as it it has a top speed of 18 knots so it can't run away from it it's lightness hasn't saved it any advantage in speed so it, it, it can't get away and Whilst it has armor on its turrets, the big solid mass, the thing which is likely to be hit, has the worst armor they could get at the time, and still call it armor. You know what, I'm not surprised all three of the class get sunk. I, 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 I'm going to be careful of this because I know I regularly defend the tribal class and point out just because 12 of them out of 16 of the originals are lost in World War II. It's not because they're a bad design. It's actually they're a very good design. It's because they're used so much. And so you can disappoint these ships to go, well, they're being used a lot. You know, there are two of them are in the Pacific fleet and one of them sent in the fleet that goes out to relieve the Pacific. Yes, but they should never have been anywhere near it. They shouldn't have been. Honestly, the fact that these ships are being sent out there and are actually out there as your frontline ships disturbs me. They look big, they look powerful, they're absolutely ineffective. You are sending a lot of people to die. And a lot of people will die. As have the bulkheads, have the subdivision, great. Have some decent frigating guns and have the armor actually make sense. If you're going to go to the cost of crop cemented armor, for the turrets, go to it for the casemates, go to it for the deck, well they use it for the deck actually, and go to it for the belt. Use that decent armour, protect yourself, protect your ship, protect your crew. Give it an actual chance, because if you're giving it 10 inch guns, the odds are, and it's a battleship in this period where most of them are carrying 12 inch, some of them are carrying 13 and a half inch, some of the Royal Navy ones will take many pot shots at you with their lar larger guns, you need to have some protection. Because otherwise, what are you designing this ship for? Oh, it's a second-class battleship. It's supposed to go around beating up the Colonials? Oh, goody. Let's consider who the Colonials are in this period. Nope. Can't think of anyone, uh, any one of them I'd want to send that to go and try and beat up, which wouldn't get immediately bushwhacked by everything they have. Let's be honest, send that to the South America station. There are going to be some South American nations looking at you and laughing. You send that to the Japanese, they just basically consider that, oh, target practice. The Americans, the Brits, the French, the Italians. Which power that actually is going to require you to send a battleship to actually influence them and to maybe coerce them is actually going to be intimidated by that.
you can go turn around and go, well, Alex is the same idea as the armoured cruisers. It's supposed to buy the Russian battleships time. So as the armoured cruisers buy time in for the Japanese to sort of and require you to bring more battleships out to fight face them, this requires you to bring more battleships to out to face the Russian fleet. Great idea, great point. Trouble is, this is a frigating battleship. You're already paying ninety percent of the cost, probably, to build a battleship. You are saving barely any money to get something which is a lot worse and going to cause you a lot more problems because it's called a battleship. It's running the same problem as a battlecruiser and it hasn't even got the speed and the duties of commerce protection and commerce raiding to justify itself for its weakness. And I will say this now. Of the non-Borodino battleships that get sent, of the non-Borodino battleships that get sent with the Russian 2nd and 3rd Pacific Squadrons, this is actually a saving grace. And you've just heard my opinion of it. Frankly, some of the rest of the ships, oh, good lord. Why would you take them with you? Why? Now, you might notice that the 3rd Squadron is starting to really peak a peak up and that's because the third squadron is the japanese older ships but they are not necessarily organized in a silly in a silly way they're mostly organized in a way that they can provide support and again they're grouped together in such a way to be sensible we've got the fuji which is another of the uh, Imperial Japanese Navy's battleships. We have an unprotected cruiser slash dispatch vessel, the Totsucha, Totsucha, and then we have the protected cruisers of the 6th Division, uh, the Suma class Suma, the Izumi, which was uh, previously the Esmeralda of the Chilean Navy and often cited as the first protected cruiser. So you have some interesting ships here, and it's, again, it's how the Japanese have grown their force. They've grown their force by buying where they had to. Building when they can, buying when they had to. Now... You've also got another point here, and please note this. Second Scouting Division technically doesn't have an Admiral and doesn't seem to ever have one. So theoretically, it's under the command of Captain First Rank Sergei Shain of the Russians. However, I have a sneaking suspicion, a very disturbing sneaking suspicion, that... It is actually being coordinated more by Rosensky's staff again. It's more work being placed on Rosensky, in which case he doesn't have an admiral as senior scout. He also has the Navarin with him, and the Navarin, if you've ever seen the Royal Navy's Trafalgar class, um, Victorian era battleships. They have a really low free board. It's 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 disturbingly low. Yeah, some bright spark says, look, this battleship's available, we'll send that one with you. Because everyone is going, let's send as much as we can, because that will guarantee victory. Honestly, if I was Rosensky, I'd have been tempted to sink some of the ships myself. But even that is not the worst battleship he sent with. <laughs> there are coastal defense battleships. One of them, which literally, he was in charge of the operation that floated it, refloated it after it sunk. Here. And, yeah. Still, not the worst. There is an honest ship here, which is called the Sisal Veliki. And that is a ship which literally 
spent years in yards being fixed. It was a permanent yard queen. Honestly, to say that Rosensky is being sent to the Far East on this 18,000 nautical mile voyage with the scrapings of the barrel and whatever's available is to be charitable and to the Russian fleet and rude to the barrel. And it's not actually to the char uh, charitable to the Russian fleet. It's charitable to the Russian government and the way they treated the fleet and the way they invested in the fleet. It's charitable. On many, many levels. Many levels. <sighs> now, one of the... If I keep discussing the, uh, the, the... The problematic... Battleships and vessels on the Russian side. I need to also look at the problematic ones on the Japanese side. And... Quite often, it's listed, their force is listed as having five battleships. And I always found this interesting, because when I was looking through the order of battle and, and you know, various things, I was going, well, they have all these ships, but I, I don't see the fifth one. I, I can see all the ships they make. They have, you know, they have the Mikasa, the Shikishima, the Fuji, the Asai. Those are their four battleships. Those are their four battleships. And then I remembered, hang on, they also have the captured ship there, don't they? And sitting, sitting in the 5th Division. And um, please note this, this is the 5th Division, which is under command of Rear Admiral Takatumi Kuakane, which is in the 3rd Squadron, is the Shinin, which is a rebuilt captured Dinguan class vessel, the Zenuan. Interesting to note that the Admiral, both the Vice Admiral in charge of 3rd Squadron, uh, Katoka, uh, Katoka, uh, Kataoka and Shinish, uh, Katako Shishiro and the Rear Admiral in charge of 5th Division, uh, Takitomi Kunanake, uh, both decided that they were not going anywhere near this ship. She's basically tucked the back in 5th Division between um, three protected cruisers uh, and a dispatch vessel to provide, I'm not sure what, extra firepower if something really goes wrong? A sacrificial lamb? There are honest options, but I would have said if she'd been tucked back as a sacrificial lamb, I'd expect her to be with the ironclad cruiser of the 7th Division, uh, the Fuso. But she's not. She's there. She's in the 5th Division, doing what she needs to do and being a support. She was another benefit of the First Sino-Japanese War. The fact that they had gained this extra battleship, which honestly was useful for a short term, but mainly in telling them exactly what they didn't want. I would again love to say that she is probably the worst battleship there but uh, at the battle but she probably isn't because they've modernized her and because how do i put this politely she's there in a supporting role and in a supporting role as pretty much a second line battleship which is being used as if we run into major trouble or if there is any issues which you know we end up when we're dispersed, needing something slightly bigger and meaner to take uh, take control and fight against rather than an, a protected cruiser. We have this. She sort of makes sense and fits in the role. Ah, oh, that brings us to this group. I do love them. I love them all. But this is, of course, the greatest concentration of... Of the of the third squadron and their ships, including their flagship, the Itsukashima class Matsushima, which is the third squadron flagship. It's a it's a good ship. It's a capable ship. It's a very useful ship.
and it is the protected cruiser which is the first strongest flagship and they also have three more divisions of torpedo sh uh, uh, boats which i don't have listed on this which are the first 11th and 20th divisions which are for each four boats they're numbered boats and trying to find out their years etc and their styles is very interesting you also have the 1888 unprotected cruiser, the uh, Takao, which was built during the Emil Bertin advising Juna Cole phase of Japanese naval thinking. Yes, Emil Bertin, that absolutely amazing naval architect from France, who I talked about in the Juna Cole videos and various other things. Oh Lord, thank, uh, Japan survived it. It's an amazing thing, but they did survive it. There are, of course, some of the Russian armoured cruisers. If we notice that there are quite a lot of the Russian cruisers, especially the armoured cruisers and the, these supposed things which are supposed to give them some firepower, are um, older than their equivalents from the Japanese. But there is also something here which I have been building up to. Something which I have been talking about the whole way through. I've been hinting that there is a very, very... Very, oh my lord, why did you do this? Why, why would you do this to your own navy? Why would you send that with them? Ship. It's actually a flagship as well. This is, this is where it gets really, really bad. Because, well... <sighs> okay, so I've put it as someone saw the... Uh, HMS Victoria and the Sans Perel and thought, those are good ideas, let's develop that. And they, they really did. The thing is, the Russians actually, um, they start off with the Imperator Alexander II, which is similar design. And they start off by planning this vessel to be smaller. The Nikolai the first was supposed to be a smaller version than that. The Alexander the second is 9,392 tons. This ends up at 9,748 tons, so it ends up bigger. It ends up bigger. It was designed to be smaller and then growth of things. And that's that just tells you so much. So great. Uh, good, good. That's great design control. That's design control. We're designing something to be smaller. And it ends up growing to be bigger than it was what was designed to be smaller than that. Uh, by how many tons? Oh, just just 400 or so. Oh, yeah, a rounding error. No, it's a rounding error in a four, in a, uh, a, a hundred thousand ton ship. In a um, in a four thousand ton ship, that'd be ten percent. In an eight thousand ton ship, that's five percent. In a less than ten thousand ton vessel. That's four percent. That's that's quite a big growth margin. That's a very big growth margin. It ends up being captured by the Japanese and um, sunk as a target in third of October nineteen fifteen because frankly they can't see any other valuable use for it. She had been laid down in eighteen eighty six, launched in eighteen eighty nine. She participated in the four, well, in the discovery, in the 400th anniversary of discovery of America in 1892 as their representative. She was from the Baltic fleet. She's assigned to Mediterranean Squadron, visits Toulon in October 1893. She is in the Pacific Ocean during the First Sino Japanese War. Remains there to 1896, then she returns to Mediterranean Squadron and takes part in their protection of their interests during the Cretan Revolt. She returns to the Baltic in 1898, has all her machinery replaced, and returns to Mediterranean again in 1901. She is refitted specially to serve as the flagship of the 3rd Pacific Squadron under Rear Admiral Nikolai Nemogatov. She is only slightly damaged in the battle, 
That is mostly because the Japanese didn't think she was worth it. And when Admiral Nebogatov surrenders the following day, he surrenders her along with most of the 3rd Pacific Squadron. This ship, this nearly 10,000 ton uh, vessel, has twin 12 inch guns forward, a pair of them. So, pretty much useless, because two guns forward for ranging, firing, oh, that's going to be fun. This is basically a monitor with some sea keeping. It has a top speed of 14 knots. That's that. That's great for sending into a fleet action. I mean, he's got no ships to provide him with scouting. He's got not, uh, not he hasn't got enough destroyers or torpedo boats. So let's send him a battleship, which actually has twelve inch guns. So it's going to be more useful in some regards than the ten inch gun battleships. But it's got a top speed of fourteen knots, so it's going to slow them down even more. They have compound expansion engines. It has compound armor. It has a range of 2,630 nautical miles at 10 knots. It had four single 9 inch guns, eight single 6 inch guns, a whole plethora of other guns, and. It's just. <sighs> they imported the armor from the UK. But here is the thing, she is lighter than her half-sister, and yet the armor belt was reduced six inches in height of the waterline, not on the belt. It was eight feet in tall in total, of which three feet was designed to be above the water and five feet below. Trouble is, of course, she often actually was slightly lower in the water. Just the amount of Russian ships which are designed to be not as good as existing ships. We've got second class battleships, and then we've got this, which is designed to be smaller, lighter, and then ends up being bigger, heavier, and less armored than the other vessel, her half sister. And you send it as the flagship of your third squadron? Honestly, this entire force, when you start looking through it, when you go through the whole setting of, of the force, you are looking at a scenario where, honestly, the Russians are sending ships because they're sending what they have for the status of what they have and they're getting themselves killed. They are getting themselves killed by this. Because they're sending ships which have no right to be going to that kind of battle. Have no right to be anywhere near this. The Borodinos, maybe, probably. But everything else Pretty much everything else that's there. Maybe some of their protected cruisers and armored cruisers. You could take some of them. You can justify that to an extent. But everything else just serves to illustrate what a hollow force. They just had ships for the sake of saying they had ships. And they were sending a fleet for the sake, the sake of saying they were sending a fleet. I'll give an example that's more modern. If we compare it to the Falklands War. It's as if the Royal Navy decided to send down to the Falkland Islands their carriers, their amphibs. You know, the, the amphibious ships, I, the landing ships, HMS Fearless, HMS Trepid, the carriers, and a whole load of merchant ships to supply the fleet, but didn't send a single escort. That's the kind of structure we're talking about. Or maybe to send a couple of Type 22s. And the capital ships they've dragged out aren't, you know, to make sure they have the maximum number, they've gone into the museums of, these were not even good ideas when they were built, let alone now. 
Let alone 15 years later, with all the technological developments happened in those last 15 years. Let alone going up a fleet against a fleet which has mostly been built and created in the last 5 to 10 years. With taking advantage of all of that technology. Yeah, we have strength, but we don't. We have strength on paper. We don't have strength in reality. So now we've looked at the fleet, let's consider some of the battle and the voyage out. This is the reality of logistics. You have all these forces being tied together. Yes, the the fleet coming from the Bal uh, coming from the Baltic has all sorts of interesting engagements with fishing boats. Then they have to split up because, honestly, some can make it through the Suez Canal and will be allowed through the Suez Canal. Some ships won't. The Royal Navy is prepared to be kind and friendly on some fronts, but ours they're not. And that adds time onto the trip, and this adds wear and tear. You've got to take those ships around. You have to take those ships around Africa. That's wear and tear 101. That's going to be damaging them. That's going to be damaging their crews. Some ships, they're going to come straight through the Suez Canal, straight out of the Black Sea, and, well, straight across the Indian Ocean. And all are going to meet up in French Indochina. They start off in February 1905. Some of them as early as October 1904. And they reach French Indochina. The last of them that are getting there, going to get there by May 1905. They've got all that way. There have been, uh, you know, that's a travel time not just of months, but think of that in terms of hours of service those ships, those engines going. What do they really need at this point? They need a dry dock. What do they really need at this point? They need a nice yard to clean them out, to clear the ships down, to fix all the problems to check all the plating that's come loose in the wet emotion of waves and damage of the seas to basically work out all the problems they have developed over several thousand and it's 16,000 nautical miles so many thousands of nautical miles journey and to get to where they need to go they need to go past Japan itself I mean, let's put it this way. Let's go through the planning agreement for this operation. We're going to sail you all the way around the world. We're not going to be able to refit you at the end. And then you're going to have to sail literally past not just the, the home nation of the nation we're fighting, but past many of their critical bases where their fleet can be supported from in that condition to get to a port where we can finally refit and prepare, repair you. Oh, by the way, the, fort, uh, the port that can refit and repair you, the options are for them are one which probably can't do it and one which is under siege. It's hubris. It's a waste of ships, it's a waste of men, it's a waste of treasure, it's a waste of everything. It's a futile gesture. It's something put together by people who will read tables like this one at the beginning. 
Let's click through and get to it. And go, of course you're going to win. You're bigger and better. In other words, and this is going to probably upset YouTube, but I'm going to say it. And it's this, one of the strongest words I've probably ever used on this channel. It's a decision made by a moron. Yeah. We all know they're out there in the world. They are people who know everything but absolutely know nothing. And in this case, they are presuming all battleships are built equally. Well, they're not. The Borodinos are quite good as battleships, but let's be honest, the Japanese battleships were mostly better. And the thing is, the Japanese fleet had maneuverability. The Japanese fleet had firepower. The Japanese fleet had a lot of armoured cruisers which were designed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with battleships to support their battleships, which meant they had long-range guns and were capable of using them. And most importantly than all of this, more importantly than everything else, the Japanese would be fighting in their back garden. In fact, they wouldn't be fighting in the back garden. They'd be fighting on their front porch. In an area where they could get resupply at the drop of a hat. Where they could bring everything, and they do bring everything to bear. When they can literally rain torpedo boats and destroyers down on you. Which are going to affect your operations, your, your, your planning, your movements. The thing is, most of the officers, and I'm certain a vast majority of the NCOs and men as well, will have understood exactly what was happening. Any experienced ones would have known exactly what they were going to. That's a level of bravery there, but it's also a level of, I can understand what happens, why they surrender. I can understand why they fall apart like they do. This is a fleet which has been driven on mostly by the will of Rosensky. Rosensky. It's been mostly been got held together by the will of Rosensky. This is why Admiral Hiroshiro wins the battle and is definitely the greater fighting admiral. But I would not want to pick between the two as to which was the better admiral. Because to hold this fleet together and get this fleet out there is a feat of leadership. It's... Rosensky deserves so much more praise for what he accomplished than what he got, than what he still gets. There are many things you can use to describe it, and there are many modern phrases that people might turn around and use, but honestly, it's leadership. It's pure, unadulterated, unadulterated skill and force of personality that holds that fleet together and gets it there. It's a forlorn hope. And unlike a forlorn hope, he doesn't have the rest of the army coming behind him. He has no support. He has less than no support. He's being, ab he's being actively loaded down with dead weight. It's just, it's absurd. And it's rather unsurprising, given those circumstances, that he's aiming for Vladivostok. He's aiming for Vladivostok because Port Arthur had fallen. It fell on January the 1st, 1905, I think. Yes. January 2nd. Sorry. Not 1st. That was a day out, 1905. So it had actually fallen for quite a long time, a long part of the voyage. In fact, some of the forces had actually left after Port Arthur had fallen. That was probably a point at which they should have I don't know, call them Mac. I do sometimes wonder if he waits around quite so long in French in the China, hoping either that his more old crockety ships will break down and not be able to come with him, or that he'll get ordered to return, because frankly he knows what comes next. Next is to make a attempt on Vladivostok. To go right past Japan to Vladivostok. Yeah. His options are to go inside of Japan or outside of Japan. Either way, he's going to go past Japan. If he goes outside of Japan, then, frankly, all the 
fleet under Togahir Shiro will do is go up the inside of Japan and be waiting for him when he gets tries to go past it. So he might as well blast through it at the beginning rather than the end after having sailed around Japan and added even more miles onto his ships and even more work onto his ships. <sighs> The Russians tried to use fog to their advantage. Unfortunately for them, the Japanese had a lot of people out viewing, and the Russians were following the rules of war. The rules of war required that the hospital ship, the Orel, keep lights on to illustrate its position. So it kept them on. Like this is again where a command admiral might well have been more creative in how those lights were kept on. But Rosensky is going to follow the orders and follow the rules of war because he's that kind of admiral. And that meant the Shinano Maro approaches her. Doral mistook the Shinano Maru for another Russian vessel. And so didn't notify the fleet. And said she signals helpfully to the Shinao Maru that there were other Russian vessels nearby. And so Shinao Maru sights them. At this point, the wireless gets involved. And Captain Narakawa sends a message. The enemy is in square 203. By 0500 hours, the Russians have received enough intercepts of radio signals that they realize they've been discovered and that they're being shadowed by Japanese cruisers. Togo had received his, mission, his message, which was sent by o, at 0.455 hours, by 0.505 hours. So within 10 minutes, his staff has read the message. They've already given out orders. To hire, the command structure is already working. The crews are being sent and already uh, being put forward. And Togo is informed at uh, 10 minutes, within 10 minutes. And he sorters his battle fleet. He manages to sort sortie Taking the combined fleet, he has them sitting based in Korea. And he signals the Japanese, uh, the Japanese government what he's going to do. And he takes them out. He, the, they have not even been sailing. They are literally sitting there waiting for the Russians to arrive. This is... Look, there's a recent scene in a Marvel movie, Guardians of the Galaxy, the recent one, where there is a discussion whether something is a trap or a face-off. It's argued it's not a trap if you know it's a trap and you're going into it with, uh, with arms and you're going to fight them and therefore it's a face-off. There is no discussion in that scenario of what it is when you know you're going into the enemy's strongest part at your weakest point. And whilst theoretically you have guns compared to them, they're going to be rested, well prepared and well armed, and you're going to be strung out. Oh, there is. It's called a massacre. Surprisingly enough, that's what happens. I do love the signal from Togo to uh, the Navy Minister that is informing the government what he's going to do. Uh, in response to the warning the enemy ships have been sighted, the combined fleet will immediately con uh, commence action and attempt to attack and destroy them. Weather today is fine, but high waves. Everything you need. And unsurprisingly, that last sentence has become the Japanese equivalent of Drake continuing bowling while the Spanish Armada is coming up the channel. It's just, it's, this is part of their creation myth. 
justifiably so. And Togo has, well, Hajira has obviously been uh, reading some of his um, Nelsonic literature because at 1340 hours, the fleets sight each other. At 1355 hours, he issues a hoist Z flag, which is a predetermined announcement of the fleet. The Empire's fate depends on the results of this battle. Let every man do his utmost duty. Right up there with England expects, isn't it? Okay, let's be honest. Here, Admiral Togo Hiroshiro is... Well, how do I put this politely? He is not bad. He is certainly not bad at the whole... Uh... How do I put this politely? At the whole public relations morale thing. He, he, he's followed, he's studied, he's got people who understand it on his staff and he will use it. He's also realizing that this battle is important on another level. He wants this battle to impress Britain, to impress the other islands, but also echo around the world. And if it fits, some parts of it fit a traditionally accepted mold, it's more likely to do so. The Japanese steamed from northeast to southwest. The Russians were sailing from south southwest to north northeast. Uh, this meant that their bow guns could only bear and automatically gave Hiroshiro, Togo Hiroshiro, the advantage of being able to bring all of his guns to bear and cross their T. This is seriously. Stuff you shouldn't do, but honestly, what are the options? What options does Rosensky have? He has to go through. He's not got enough fuel or anything to really do anything fancy. He's got to keep going. Basically, form column and charge is it. Maybe form line abreast, but that's going to be a whole lot of maneuvering and might not help. Togo turned his fleet in sequence, enabling his ships to follow the same course as the Russians. And this was actually quite a risky maneuver, because if the Russians had had their firing and ability to contro control their long-range fire and coordinate themselves dialed in, they could have fired at the same, by firing at the same point, damaged each battleship in turn as it went for its turn. Because if you're turning a sequence, you're turning each ship individually. So you're going that one, then that one, then that one, going around for it. So they're all going through the same point to turn. Which means if you can aim at that point, you can massacre them. But the Russians weren't able to do that. Russians did manage to get some gunnery in. They managed to hit the Mikasa 15 times in 5 minutes. And she'd be struck 30 times by large caliber shells throughout the action. So, they do have some good. Uh, there is an argument that might have been Rosensky's own flagship. There is an argument, because he was a gunnery officer, fairly good gunnery officer, kind of like Admiral Lee. His flagship was very worked up on its gunnery. Rosensky's faced with a dilemma. He charges straight in, or he now, they being offered it, he tries to go for a pitch battle. Does he think he has a chance of charging through? No. Does he think his ships are in condition for a pitch battle? Probably not. But it's the lesser of two evils. It's the safest of the dilemma options. The Japanese held their fire till about 6,400 meters. Japanese gunnery was unsurprisingly superior. Their ships were better maintained. Their crews have been doing far more gunnery training and have been fighting a war for a long time and many generations of fighting a war by this point. 
so they had the training, but also they hadn't just sailed thousands of miles. They hadn't been having problems with mutinies. They hadn't been problems with having problems with food quality. They hadn't been having problems with their own officers being sometimes drunk and depressed because they know exactly what they're going into. No, the Japanese are fighting for their homelands. They're fighting for victory, and they are fighting well rested, well trained, and well fed. There is a difference. And also, I would like to say that the Japanese also do not, do not have the most annoying rank of naval warfare that I ever find. Captain Second Rank. I absolutely despise First and Second Rank Captains or anything like that. I, I, I find it all absurd. Have different names for it. That makes sense. And the moment you have First and Second Rank and you have those going around, it just seems to me... Uh, you are asking for trouble because they're both called captain but one's a second rank one's a first rank this this, uh, this is coming an issue on a ship you need a captain but that's personal personal bias I do realise and personal preference I just don't like it but a staff officer about the Kenner sort of felt that it was uh, who was a captain second rank uh, Vladimir Semenov is gives another famous quote, which was, It was impossible even to count the number of projectiles striking us. Shells seemed to be pouring upon us incessantly, one after another. The steel plates and superstructure of the upper decks were torn to pieces, and spinners caused many casualties. Ladders were crumpled up into rings. Guns were hurled from their mountings. In addition to this, there was the unusually high temperature and liquid flame of the explosion, which seemed to spread over everything. I actually watched the steel plate catch fire from a burst. That's a steel plate which has been hit multiple times. You can, believe it or not, if you hit steel enough, you can make it start burning the paint and various things off it. The battle lasts roughly 90 minutes. In real terms. It's at a, it, it peters, it carries on going for hours, and it's only at 8 o'clock at night, 20 hundred hours, that the destroyers and torpedo boats are thrown against the Russians. With the, tor the destroyers attacking from the van and the torpedo boats from the east and south of the Russian fleet, basically surrounding them and attacking them, it's just... It's just a nightmare. But the thing is, at 90 minutes into the battle, the reason I picked that point as the battle's really summing over was that was when the Osilobaya, the second class battleship, one of the battleships of the second battleship division, the flagship of the second battleship division, is sunk. This is often stated as the first time a... Uh, Modern warship is sunk by gunfire alone, but you already heard my views on her, so frankly, yeah, we're not going with that. Borodino's magazines are hit by shells from Fuji, which cause her to explode. Rosensky himself is knocked out of action by a shell fragment that, sh that strikes his skull. And it's hours before Nebogatov takes command of the Russian fleet. This is the gentleman who's in charge, a rear admiral Nebogatov, who's in charge of the third squadron. It's, it's one of those really interesting things when you consider the sheer, the sheer distance they've gone. The fact they didn't have a better command structure in place about who would t uh, how quickly and how who would take command what the roles were how to pass on command is quite worrying but there again honestly could Rosensky trust anyone and did they have the ability to do, do it the russians lose their borodinos borodino kinesorov imperator alexander the 3rd and alsiba all get lost so they lose three of their Borodinos and their last remaining second-class Pretzlov uh, battleship. 
<sighs> the idea of taking such a thing into that is just disturbing to me. The remainder of their fleet is captured. When Nebuchadnezzar surrenders, he says to his men, You are young, and it is you who will one day retrieve the honor and glory of the Russian Navy. Lives of the 2,400 men in these ships are more important than mine, considering he'll get shot for surrendering. Honestly, none of them should have been there. None of them. And then we have the summary. Amorozinski is sent to Sospo, uh, Imperial Japanese Naval Hospital. And Admiral Togo Hiroshiro visits him personally, going in, cl in plain clothes so as not to get a whole load of attention. He says the words, defeat is a common fate of a soldier. There is nothing to be ashamed of in it. The great point is whether we have performed our duty. Now, I would argue, you can't argue, that either of those didn't perform their duty. Frankly, the fleet that Rosensky is sent with, it shouldn't have been him on trial when he returned to Russia. It should have been the entire government, including the Tsar, potentially, but no, they weren't. He returns to Russia. Both him and Nemokotov are placed on trial, and Rosensky claims full responsibility, trying to get Nemokotov off it. He's not allowed to. He's sentenced to death for it. But, as he'd been wounded and was unconscious during the last part of the battle, the Tsar generously commutes his death sentence. Nebuchadnezzar is imprisoned, but eventually pardoned by the Tsar after several years in prison. The one of the lessons you learn quite early when you study British naval history is, of course, lesson Admiral Bing. Okay. Sorry. Fluffy research assistant coughing up verbal. And how he is executed. Failure to engage. Now it comes up the great line that once, upon, uh, once in a while the, uh, the uh, British uh, find it economical to execute an admiral to encourage the others. They don't really do that, but it is worth noticing. The point is, he'd, they'd failed to engage against equal odds. The Russian fleet, Rosensky and Nebuchadnezzar, engaged against overwhelming odds, I would argue, once you look at the realities of the fleet, rather than the ideas of a battleship is a battleship is a battleship. And they fought as well as they could, considering the circumstances. And yes, they got defeated, but they certainly suffered no dishonour. They certainly can't be accused of not doing their duty or behaving with honour. They fought hard. And honestly, looking at Nebuchadnezzar's flagship, honestly, if this is your last remaining battleship, do you really want to go and fight a fleet? Of, well, these? Do you really? No, I wouldn't. I don't think anyone sane would. You'd just get your fleet killed. And if that is cowardice, if that is worthy of years of imprisonment, then you've got a seriously mucked up system. And we know the Russians did have a seriously mucked up system. The Russians were pursued, even the ones that had managed to escape, and three warships managed to reach Vladivostok. Uh, the Izmirad were uh, managed to escape the Japanese despite being at Nemokhodov's surrender and is destroyed by her crew running after runs aground on the Siberian coast. <sighs> the Imperial Russian Admiralty Council had opposed the dispatch of the fleet because 
The Japanese Navy has completed bad operations with all their crew having some common experience. Long voyage is mostly through extreme tropical weather, so meaningful training is practically impossible in the way. Therefore, newly created Second Pacific Fleet should conduct training in the Baltic until next spring while waiting for the rigging of another battleship, the Slava, and the purchase of Chilean and Argentine, Argentine warships. They didn't wait. Because the Imperial Council... Overruled. Rosansky went along with it because they had already arranged all the coaling for the long voyage, and if the Navy broke that contract signed with the Habsburg American Steamship Line of Germany, they might not get another, and then they wouldn't be able to go at all. The fact that pretty much the moment he was asked to command it, he tried his best to work out how to do it, but the fact is he's locked in by his own ability to organize logistically. Getting that coaling, getting those stations, getting that fuel there for the there for fleet. That's critical. That is absolutely critical. The Russians lose several ships in this battle. That's the reality is they have six of their battleships sunk, uh, one of the coastal battleships sunk, um, 14 of the other vessels are sunk. And if you consider that they turn up originally, originally, with 38 vessels, and your t uh, 21 are sunk, five are captured, six are disarmed. That's really not good odds. And the Japanese, they also lose ships. Free torpedo boats. It's proportionally the worst defeat suffered by a fleet ever. If we consider out of the size of the total Russian fleet, the amount that has lost at Toshima is devastating. It's overwhelming. It is a Kantai Kessin, a decisive battle. It's where the Japanese get that doctrine from. They want to achieve another Tsushima. I once read a book where someone was kept talking about how the Japanese wanted to achieve another Trafalgar. They'd already achieved that Tsushima. I was fairly sure that author hadn't bothered to study any Japanese naval history at all for their power, their at their throwaway chapter in a strategic studies book because they keep going on about it. But arguably, Tashima is a greater victory than Trafalgar if you consider the fact the relative powers of those two nations starting out. But it fails because just like Trafalgar, the Franco-Spanish fleet have been in port they have done some sailing, so they've had a bit more experience, and they actually have some command and fight and, and, and capability to actually respond to the plans of Nelson. Rosensky and the Russian ships don't. Rosensky and the Russian ships are seriously let down. They are forced into a corner of where to go. Again, it's not perfect. No admiral is perfect. And please note that if I had to pick which fleet I'd be with in this battle, it would be with Togo Hiroshiro aboard the Mikasa. Getting hit by 30 heavy rounds or not, that's where I want to be. But Rosnansky, he's done his best. He has. 
So coming up, why no more battleships? That's next week's, next Tuesday's video. And Operation Berlin. That's Thursdays and Saturdays. This is going to be late going live this evening. I know it's going to be late because I'm finishing re-recording sections of this at 6 o'clock and it will take at least two hours to upload. <laughs> so I doubt this will see the light of day before 9 o'clock. Hope you enjoyed and thank you very much. I want to finish as always with a question. And the question is this. If Rosensky had somehow managed to win at Toshima, what do you think would have happened? I have a personal view that if he wins, the Japanese just reorganize and come back and beat him up again. But what happens if he managed to win at Toshima? What does that really have an effect on things, considering Port Arthur has already fallen? What does it do? How does it change the world thank you very much for watching hope you enjoyed thank you